Woodcraft since 1928, providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Hello, come on in. My name is Rick Booth. Welcome to Wood Carving. Today we're going to finish up our early American Eagle that we started last week. I just used a bow saw and finished cutting out the head. This is the same saw that I used last week when we cut out the wings for the bird. And as you remember, we used some of the larger tools and shaped down these uh, feathers and detail them. And I went ahead and finished doing the detailing on the other side and added a little paint here just to kind of see how the shield was going to look. I used acrylics on that, but you can also use enamels or whatever. The, today, we're going to be shaping the head, and then we'll cut it from the block and screw it on, stain it, and we'll see what we have. Let me put him out of the way here. Put the bow saw back. I usually try to keep the clutter down to a manageable chaos here. In doing the head, I left a good chunk of wood on the other side, and that way I can take and fasten it in the vise from different angles and make it a little easier to work. To start with, I'm going to use a large gouge to start shaping this guy out. This will be the large number seven that we used to rough things out with last time. Get them lined up right. Now I'll turn them over. These guidelines I just sketched in here based on Bellamy's pattern. And that'll give us a guide while we're working on them. I'll come along here. I'm going to go to a flatter number five here. this around. I think I can finish this by hand around here. Round this down. Nice shape in these designs that John Bellamy had. He really had a flair as an artist. Unfortunately, like a lot of artists, he wasn't a very good businessman. And he would just get a nice business going someplace and then pack up his shop and move to another town. This is a pattern that pretty much plagued him all of his life. He spent most of his time between Kittery, Maine and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 
He was quite an accomplished carver and recognized as an artist. Several of his designs actually had patents. Unfortunately, there seemed to be a little difference in how he shaped the heads. And I think that often depended on his degree of sobriety at the particular time he was doing his carvings. But one thing you got to say, he really knew what an eagle looked like. Even though these carvings are somewhat stylized, it still has the, the flavor and the feeling and the, the, the majesty that an eagle would have. A lot of these colonial carvers often made their eagles look like chickens. And that's what they were familiar with. But not with John Bellamy. His really looked like eagles. I like eagles. And I think it's a good, a good bird for a national emblem. Remember several times out west, up in the Rockies, sitting up in the mountains and watching the eagles down below. They'd nest in the cliffs, and then they'd start rising up with the thermals. And it's a very majestic bird. You just have to have a lot of admiration for anything that's got that much size. And uh, I don't know, it just looks so beautiful when they're flying. Now we're coming around here a bit. Now see, one of the things that's happening here is, as I'm coming around here, this is where the grain is going this way in the wood. So that means that when I'm coming around here, I'm going with the grain. But when I start getting into here, I'm going against the grain. And I can tell you, start going in here, and you hear the wood starting to split and tear a little bit. And that's the warning sign. That's the wood saying, hey, you better slow down. Because I know if I keep going here, I can just knock this whole chunk right off, which I don't want to do today. So when you start hearing that splintering sound, you take, turn the wood around, and just carve it from the other direction. And that cleans it up. I think that's one of the things that really fascinates me about wood carving. And that is, it's not just shaping a piece of wood. It's an act of cooperation between you and the wood. Now, someone who's making furniture, they can do anything they want with the wood. They can take it. They can machine it. They can steam it. You can take a board. You can turn it into a circle if you want. But you can't do that with wood carving. Okay, now I've got most of the rough cuts done on the head, and it's time to start doing some of the finishing cuts that give the, the, the tool marks and the hand texture to it. The secret to getting clean tool marks is to make sure your tools are absolutely razor sharp. So before I start doing more detailing here, let me just take a minute and put an edge on this tool. The best thing I found for sharpening is a, uh, it's called a combination India stone. It's got a coarse side on one side and a fine side on the other. It's called an India stone because it's a synthetic stone that was made to copy a natural stone that was found in India. Oh, very popular stone back in the 1800s. I almost never use the core side unless I've dropped the tool and it's got a big nick in it. To sharpen it, just put a few drops of oil on. The oil is important because it floats away the little metal filings that you get when you sharpen it. And just rock this tool back and forth on the stone. Be careful not to roll it too far so you don't round off the corners. You want those sharp. Well, after you've worked that for a while, What'll happen is you'll get a little burr edge or a wire edge that forms on the end. That means you've gone as far as this stone is going to allow. If you just sharpen more with this particular grit, it's just going to get more and more of a burr edge. You can't see it. It's almost microscopic. But you can feel it by running your finger along away from the cutting edge. Don't go this way. Just go away from the edge. And you'll feel a little bit of a burr. To get that off, take some more oil 
in a sharpening stone called a slip stone. And this is rounded on one edge and flat on the other and has another fine thing for getting inside a very tiny gouge. Take and put a few drops of oil on it and then just rub it against the inside edge of the stone. Now when you're doing this, brace your elbows against your body and then hold the gouge still and then just move the stone up and down. This is a very fine stone. This one is called a black Arkansas stone. It's a natural stone mined near the hot springs in Arkansas and an extremely fine grit. It almost feels like glass. It's so smooth. To do the other side, just take and polish the other side here like this. This will sharpen it to a very fine edge and wear away that burr that you have there. You have to get the burr off because otherwise it'll fold over and dull your cutting edge. I always wipe the oil off the stone when you put it away and that keeps the metal filings from soaking in and clogging the stone. Now to test for sharpness, get yourself a soft piece of wood like, uh, like a piece of pine here. Here's a nice scrap. And then take your tool, and on this one, the wood grain is going across here. You can see by these little streaks in the wood. Take your tool and carve at right angles to that. Carve across the grain. Hear that whistling sound? That means the tool is sharp. You're getting nice little shavings shaping up here. If the tool is dull, it'll tear and crush the fibers. Let's see, I think I might have one that needs some sharpening. I can. Sh this looks like it needs some work. Listen to the difference here. Hear that? You can feel it, you can hear it, you can see it. It's all ripped up there. Whereas a sharp tool just takes and just carves that away real nice and slick. So anyway, that's really all there is to tool sharpening. The big thing about sharpening is it just takes a lot of practice. So um, just persevere and you'll be okay. The funny thing about sharpening is that just about every woodcarver you talk to has a slightly different way of doing it, which gets kind of confusing. The reason I want the tool sharp for these finishing cuts is because it'll give it a nice polished surface. It makes nice smooth facets in the wood. Okay, I've got that where I want it smoothed down. Now it's time to start doing some detailing. I'll take our pattern here. This is the original pattern that we used to, to make our cutout. We have a kind of an interesting situation here because John Bellamy did his carvings with the mouth sort of open and the tongue was detailed. And that's a little tricky to carve, but I'll show you a trick. This is what he did. Take and mark out your pattern on the wood. Then you take a drill. This is a nice handy drill. This is called a carriage drill. And people would use it for drilling holes when they're making wagons and coaches and things. They'd hold it and they just and they could brace their body against it and get added power. This one, uh, incidentally, the date on this is like uh, 1890s, patented January 21st, 1890. There's an interesting story behind this drill. I didn't find this really. My cats found it up in my barn. I had cleaned the place out and thought I had anything that was any good. And they came out there one day and this thing was just laying on the ground. And my cats had uh, taken and knocked it out of the rafters. And there it was. So we just drill a hole down through there. 
Then we take, ah, here we go, our coping saw. Now remember we used this the other day. This has uh, got a very thin blade stretched in a metal frame. And what you can do with this is the handle unscrews and comes right off. One handle. The blade unhooks, and then you stick that through the hole, fasten it again. You really need three hands for doing this. Handle screws back on, and you adjust the tension to where you want it. Nice thing about this saw is that you can turn this blade around from different angles so that uh, your frame doesn't get in the way, and you can cut all sorts of complicated little curves if you want. Then we just cut along here like this. And there's our little piece. And just do the same thing for the lower part of the mouth. Just use a smaller uh, drill bit. And you can cut that one right out too. Now let me just take a minute and draw in some of the feathers here. Remember last time we were carving the feathers and we were detailing them using a V gouge and then paring it away with a fishtail? This tool I'd like to show you is called a macaroni gouge. It's used like a V tool and you can get a very long flat taper on that side. and You can make a cut so it tapers to the left or to the right. It's called a macaroni gouge and it was probably invented in Italy sometime in the 1600s. It's a very handy tool for feathering. You just work that right around there. And you can listen to that, uh, that whistling sound that is a sign of having a sharp tool. Let's see, I think. I've got to stop and think on the cur on the how the grain goes with these curves. That's one of the tricks with working a carving like this. It's really good practice because you have all these different angles and you really have to stop sometimes and think, am I going to go against the grain or with the grain on this cut? That's why these are such great projects. They're a lot of fun to do. They look great when you're done. And it's good training. You learn a lot from doing them. Come around here and do some more feathers. Now I can't get all these. I'll have to eventually cut this free from the block. But I'll get as many as I can from this position. Now for doing the veins on the feathers, we can use the same tool. And just by cutting around here in a nice curve, we can cut that central shaft. Sometimes this tool is a little difficult to use because they have such a wide cutting edge, it can tend to wander just a little bit in the wood. Well, I've got them here. Let me take a V gouge and shape around the eye just a bit. And shape around his mouth. There, just take a few little pieces off there. And that's basically all there is to it. For doing the breaks in the feathers, we'll just put a couple of these little S curves like John Bellamy used. Remember, he did these little sort of, it looks like an, the old 1700s S shape where it kind of looks like a little F curve, like what you find in a violin. Anyway, just carry on doing that and then do the rest on the other side. And that will give you your eagle shape. And this is the head. 
Now we come to the real challenge. Cutting this free from the block. This is where you either end up being the hero or the goat. Because you only get one chance to cut this. And after all this work, you want to make sure you have it right. Unfortunately, I've never found any way to measure it. So I just eyeball it. Just a little more room there. Does that look pretty good? And away we go. All right. I think today we are not goats. I have a little trimming to do around the ends here. And the best way to hold that is with a bench hook. And this is just a square piece of wood. This particular one's about 12 inches by 12 inches. It's got a little piece of wood glued on this end and a piece of wood glued underneath. You can make these up from scraps and you can make them any size you want. This works by just fitting against the bench and that holds it in place and you can brace your work against there and it doesn't go anywhere. Now I'm just going to take my large number two and trim this up a bit. There. I think that does it for us. Now in yours, you'll probably want to clean up some of these black lines here just a little bit. Or as I say, use pencil. A little sandpaper will clean those off just fine. Now let's see how this guy looks all put together here. Now I drilled two screw holes in the back, so you'll want to use two screws for its permanent mounting. And that'll keep it from twisting and pivoting around. And there is our John Bellamy Eagle. Now the last thing we'll want to do is put a little stain on this guy. And clear some of the tools away. Always get in the habit of keeping your tools organized. The last thing you want to do is have your sharp tools banging against each other and dulling. Here's our stain. This one I'm using today is something called, made by a company called Minwax, which is kind of a handy stain because it's a stain and a little bit of a sealer all together. So besides just putting color on, it also hardens inside the wood. And this type of a finish is called a penetrating oil or a penetrating resin finish. And it's great for wood carvings because it's flawless. You can't make a mistake with it. All you do is just slap it on. I'm going to put it right over my paint and everything. I love staining. It's so much like playing with mud. there. Careful I don't splatter it all over my shirt. So anyway, you just slap this color on here. Got to make sure it covers everything. <laughs> Leave yourself a dry spot to pick them up with here. And then take a rag and just wipe the stuff off. There, look, see, so you know where I painted this before. I used acrylic paints on this, which is a little untraditional. But the acrylic, being a water based paint, the mineral spirits, which is a solvent for the stain, doesn't dissolve it and wash it away. If I'd used uh, something like an oil based paint, 
there's a good chance that this stain would have actually taken and dissolved some of that paint and then washed it off. Well, anyway, we'll do the back later. And this is our John Bellamy Eagle. Now, this would be great. You can hang it in your house. You can hang it outside under a sheltered place, too. But just remember, if it's exposed to a lot of uh, sunlight and elements, you may hit, run a little problem with the wood splitting. Or it just may m make it look more antique. Anyway, great project. A lot of fun to do. Next week, I'm going to do something a little different from a whole other extreme. We went from a stylized large bird. Next week, we're going to do a realistic small bird, a realistic chickadee, one of my favorites. And I'll show you how to take and make a sketch from live observation and then transfer your patterns to the wood, carve this guy out, texture and paint the feathers so it looks like he's, you know, real feathers. So, thanks for dropping by, and until next week, this is Rick Boots wishing you happy carving. You can continue to learn wood carving with Rick Boots with his book, How to Carve Wood. This 224-page book of challenging exercises and projects is full of detailed instructions. Lessons include whittling, wildlife carving, and relief carving. To order your copy, call 1-800-950-9648. Woodcraft, for all your woodworking needs, tools, supplies, lumber, project plans, and educational workshops. With the mail order catalog and stores nationwide. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work.